I collect stories. I've been in the elevators where I thought, oh, we got three floors. I got a really good story I want to tell you. And creation stories are awesome. I wanted to tell the children, though, okay, this is one, but I've got others. There are different kinds of creation stories. And yet, when I hear all these stories from all over the world, the rational side of me pops up. On this one, I'm like, we can't climb out of a hole in the sky. We can't to overcome a world of chaos and disorder, war and relationships fraught with fear and mistrust. That's not going to happen. The reality is, if we want the world we dream about, we're going to have to work on creating it today. And the great place to start is within ourselves. We have to acknowledge what keeps us from moving in the direction of greater good, of blessed community. Once we confront this reality, we must work like a heron in a hurricane to keep it, to have a steady grip on understanding this dream or this vision of a new world. What is it that holds us back? I'm going to say it. It's fear. Fear of not being perfect. Fear, the thief who lurks in the darkness and doesn't depart even when the lights come on. Fear waits to destroy our hope for harmony and peace. What else do we fear? There are so many cliched answers. We are afraid of people who are different than we are. We fear rejection. We fear fear itself, as Roosevelt stated. We are afraid of the future. We're afraid of fate. We're afraid, ultimately, of failure. While all these fears may be legitimate, the late Don Miguel Ruiz, author of several books of Toltec indigenous traditions, he wrote one years ago, probably 25 years ago, called The Four Agreements. And maybe some of you remember this. Before I go on, let me just pause a minute. A minute. We understand in this building there are lots of challenges with sound. I am a new voice, literally, in your congregation in this building. We are working on making this accommodating, my message to you, accommodating to all ears. So this morning, we're working hard, the sound people, myself, we're working hard so that you may hear my message. If it is not coming across right now, please don't be embarrassed. Walk down, get a copy of my sermon, and follow with me. I work hard on these messages, these sermons, and I have to know they will land on your ears. Thank you for that pause. Okay, so in this, Miguel wrote, Our image of perfection is the reason we reject ourselves. It is why we don't accept ourselves for the way we are and why we have such a hard time accepting other people the way they are. Rez writes, what belief has been born in our, into our society? We, all of us, have come into this society with beliefs that we're already part of the system. Even when we grow into adulthood, we remember a set of beliefs about punishment and reward. So we are unconsciously operating from a point of reward and punishment. Maybe some guilt from some of the traditions we learned as a child. And that maybe we changed how we're feeling. Just this morning we were talking about how what we learned as a child and we're testing and we're questioning as an adult can still sit within us and we say, maybe 
Maybe, maybe that was right. Maybe the way I am today is wrong. So therefore, most of us walk around with muddled conversations in our heads over what we've deliberately chosen to believe as adults and what we were taught to believe as children. Since we were raised in this system of reward and punishment, and we have behaved accordingly, we have an added layer of monkey chatter. Monkey chatter, that's what it's called, that keeps us from finding a more peaceful existence. All this mental strife, it's also called metote by the Toltecs. Metote, or mind fog. And it's present at a conscious and unconscious level. It creates distress, disease, dis-ease, which creates little room for a feeling of peace and calmness. Again, Ruiz emphasized, your mind is a dream where a thousand people talk at the same time and nobody's understanding each other. Everything you believe about yourself and the world, all concepts and programming you have in your mind, all metote. This muddled mess of feelings and notions feeds our discontent like unwanted ivy wrapping itself around a perfectly healthy tree seedling. It chokes the life out of it. Our dream of peace is threatened by a creeping killer called imperfection. What hinders the growth of peace, love, and harmony is an endless cycle of suffering tied to awkward thought patterns. These thought patterns have influenced our attitudes and our behaviors. It provokes havoc in our home lives, and even in our Unitarian Universalist congregations. Once upon a time, there was a Unitarian Universalist fellowship in a small community. They decided to host a yard sale. What a great way to get rid of household items and raise money for the operational budget. The yard sale would be a fundraiser. On Friday, the day before the Saturday event, true story, not in this congregation, in some other congregation, true story, a few excited members of the congregation were organizing items on tables in the hall. Lots of used books were donated. Sarah said, I'll get the book table ready. She set to work organizing the books by authors. Two hours later, she stood back and felt good. That table is well done, arranged, organized. She and the rest of the folks preparing for the sale the next day decided they would say goodbye for the evening and arrive at 6.30 a.m. the next day for the sale to start at 7. There were a couple of people who could not be there the day before, but they promised to come in and help on Saturday. So the next morning, with coffee in hand, Sarah stood near the book table. It was 6.30 on the dot. She was ready to help people find the perfect book. Laura, another member of the congregation, arrived, put her purse under the table, and greeted Sarah with a great big smile. Sarah is the one who organized the table the night before. Laura stood back and looked at the table and said, You know what? In my years as a librarian, one thing I figured out was that people love, love, love to browse. Laura began rearranging all the books on the table. She too stood back a couple minutes later and said, Now we are ready to sell books. Don't you think? She looked at Sarah Sarah almost spit out her coffee. Sarah said, Hey, Laura, I spent two hours yesterday arranging those books by author. I think people will want to look for a book by its author. Cliffhanger. I'm going to leave it there for a moment. Let me go back to what can help 
us live a life of peace. Peaceful personal interactions. Our own peaceful demeanor. So that we may have more peaceful, loving relationships. Let's explore those four agreements. And for those of you who might be familiar, this is a little review. Let's see if you remember. The first one, be impeccable with your word. If you say you're going to be somewhere, be there. If you can't, call somebody. Be impeccable with your word. This is why I can't come. I will reschedule. Be impeccable. Follow through. The word is a force, said Miguel Ruiz. It is the power you have to express and communicate, to think and thereby to create the events of your life. It is the tool of magic. Words can be used to build up or destroy the life of others. Now, most of us say, we got that. Okay, I'm a pretty good, honest person. I'm impeccable. I stick to what I say I'm going to do. Here's the second one, and this one is harder. Don't take things personally. Don't take things personally. Whatever anyone says to you, don't think that he or she is speaking about you. The person is speaking from his or her own place of pain or joy. If this person says, wow, you're looking good in that black dress, you might be looking good in the black dress. You can look down and say, oh yeah, I do. But really it's about them. That person loves a black dress, <laughs> and maybe loves you, but it's about the person. If somebody says, you're not doing this right, you're not organizing the, the well, that person has their own way of organizing, and it's less about you and more that to do with that person. Check in with yourself and say, hmm, is there a little truth in this? I don't think so. This is more about my friend who is important. This is important to my friend. Don't make don't take things personally. All right, this next one, this third one, is going to help you with that one. Don't make assumptions. We do this all the time. I cannot tell you how many congregation members have come up to me and said, I am sick and tired of sending my grandkids Christmas presents. They never send me a thank you letter. And they said, I can see that that bothers you. Yes, it bothers me. So are you sending the presents to your grandkids for a thank you letter? Well, of course not. Okay, if you want them to send you a thank you letter saying, I tell them, but you cannot make an assumption that because you do something, you're going to get a behavior that you want. Let go. Why are you doing this behavior? Don't make assumptions that this person is going to respond the way you want them to. Stop making assumptions. People are in pain because of assumptions constantly. I will tell you, uh, in the midst of this, trying to make sure that you can hear my voice, people have come to me and said, you need to do this, you need to do that with your voice. I am not going to make assumptions. I will check in, am I speaking clearly? But it's telling me this is about the person not being able to hear. I'm not going to make assumptions. Check in and then let it go. Don't take things personally. This is my favorite one. It's the last one. Always do your best. Were you less than your best self in a divorce you experienced 30 years ago? Can you think of times when maybe you said something you wish you hadn't said to a parent? We do our best. Commit to always doing your best, but know that your best today might not have been your best 20 years ago, and your best today may look different than your best tomorrow. Just always do your best, and then let go of the guilt you can acknowledge, maybe I wish I'd done something different, but let it go. Don't hang on to it. All of these things, being impeccable with our word, don't take things personally, don't make assumptions, and certainly do your best. Explore those four and then let them go and be at peace. Be at peace with yourself. And certainly, uh, how about this one? If you're in a partnership, my goodness, two couples who have 50-year anniversaries, I think they might know something about this. Um, when you argue 
and about two hours later, the person comes to you and goes, I'm sorry, I was just really tired. I, I bit your head off. The toast was okay, a little burnt, but that's okay, I can eat burnt toast. You, you see what I'm saying? In relationships, just check in with yourself and then communicate with the other person and try to do these four things. Please don't make assumptions. I've seen more pain by assumptions and more pain in people holding on to guilt for something they didn't do years ago. Doing your best as well as you can with what is available to you and seek to enjoy the doing. That goes back to that giving gifts to your grandkids. This makes me happy. I took the time to choose this. I'm sending it to, this to them. Let it go about whether they respond to you or not. All right. I'm going to tell you what happened at the yard sale. As you will recall, the two women were at the table. Sarah was the one who organized the books by author. Laura was the one who decided that people like to browse, so she mixed them all up. Here we are at the standstill moment. What happened next? Both women were still there, still smiling and getting along. Again, this was a true story. I witnessed this. I watched and waited for the war to begin. Later in the day, it was Sarah who told me how the encounter ended because I noticed that through all the yard sale, they were kind and smiling and happy. And Sarah came to me and said, shall I tell you what happened later? Because Sarah definitely told me what Laura had done. (laughs) And I stayed out of it and waited. Sarah said, you know, I was really aggravated. I spent two hours arranging those books, and then Laura came up and messed it all up. But guess what? Two years ago, I would have made a big fuss. I would have railed. I would have stomped out of here, but I didn't. Do you know why I didn't get mad? And I said, most definitely, please tell me why. Sarah said, I decided not to take it personally. After you survive breast cancer, you begin to look around and see the world and others differently. Really, in the bigger picture of things, that book table was such a small thing. It was our community's way of raising funds and having fun. I believe in that covenant of right relations, said Sarah, that one that hangs on the wall. The Unitarian Universalist community is my home. I am so grateful to be here. I will do everything I can to treat others with kindness and love. Blessed be our many moments of transformation. I hope that in the days ahead of you, you will consider your responses, check in with those four agreements, and I'll see you next Sunday.